So. Right now I've got a couple crash sites around Delta here. And this sort of came to a thought to me a little bit, but I'm actually wondering if I should even borrow if, uh, Haney. So you know what? We're just going to actually just blow these guys up. I'm not going to deal with this stuff. We're just going to blow them up and then I'll uh, continue on. We've actually anything down here. Send the fox trots down and have a look, maybe. Oh, there was someone down here. Let's see if I can uh, blow this guy up. Oh, oh, so this is new. So, alien circumstance aerial bomb bombing of Maputo. Local force request any Xenot re assistance. Basically, this is something that basically sometimes happens. When this happens, there's basically gonna be like air combat, not like like the terror sites, but basically air combat. So basically, we're just gonna have the fox shots hit that. Now it says zero percent chance for victory, but I do have a victory chance here. I just have to hit the bombers. More or less. Make sure they are going after the bomber. The heavy fires have slow, sort of like, you know, turning radius, and so the heavy fires against fire missiles. Boom, boom. I don't have to kill the actual heavy fire so I can just leave them alone. Unfortunately for them, they move too slow. So that's fun. Glad I sent the fox trust down there. Ilium, alien alloys, great. So ba basically, at this point, all that stuff has been done. It's time for a few uh, Wikipedia entries, more or less, or Xenopedia entries, rather. So, there's actually been a few things that sort of popped up at this point. The assault shield, I guess, is the first thing to read about, so let's go after that. The assault shield is a direct upgrade for the combat shield, employing our new knowledge of hardened alien alloys to create a tactical shield with much improved durability. It functions in the same way as its predecessor, soaking up most of the incoming damage from targets in front of the user. The vastly improved ballistic and thermal resistance of a hardened alien alloys makes them much more effective at stopping incoming damage. As fabricating a rectangle is not a difficult task, the main point of debate was over where we should design a lighter and less cumbersome shield, or leave the weight unchanged and greatly increase protection. Discussion of men revealed that they had an overall preference for a lighter, and given the brief life expectancy of breaking soldiers, I was inclined to agree with them. The assault shield should be able to withstand several hits from most alien plastic weapons before failing, hopefully enough to get the user through a mission without serious injury. The assault shield does, of course, fill one of the soldier's hands and the wield two-hand weapons. They will be forced to use a pistol. You should also be aware that the shields do not provide complete protection. There's always a small chance that a lucky shot will hit an exposed by part. I think I already read that, but whatever. This I know I haven't read, so we'll go into that. The rapid fire plasmas. We now have plasma variants of our generic infantry weapons, such as the pistols and rifles, but we are still lacking an equivalent for high rate of fire weapons, such as the machine gun or interceptor auto cannon. The infantry portable plasma caster and the most substantial aircraft mounted plasma blaster have been designed to fill this void. They work on similar principles. Both expel large amounts of plasma in the form of a sustained stream, utilizing a large generational array that to continually discharges superheated plasma. In ordinary conditions, it would be difficult to focus the stream and would be dissipated quickly, giving it short range and poor armor penetration. However, we have solved this problem by employing a ring of five graviton generators around the muzzle of the weapon. These fire se 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 sequentially, regularly injecting gravitons into the plasma and breaking the stream up into a string of individual projectiles. This effect replicates the high rate of fire of conventional automatic weapons and combines with extra damage of plasma weapon. Both should make useful upgrades in our fight against extraterrestrials. 
So basically, it's a really powerful weapon. I have to build some. And now we've got this beast. Oh yes, the Predator Assault Armor. And I'll note that basically just like, you know, almost like double the wolf armor and its, and its power. But it actually has some special abilities that go along with this. Besides the chemical armor. So the Predator Assault Armor. The S2 Predator Assault Armor is a powerful personal exoskeleton designed for heavy assault and breaching action. It offers exceptional protection and is powerful enough to wield heavy weapons without suffering movement or recoil penalties, transforming the wearer into a fearsome walking tank. The Predator's main armor plates are nearly an inch thick and formed from hardened alien alloys, whilst the joints use sliding layers of thinner plates to offer both flexibility and strength, even at its weakest point. The armor is still a centimeter thick. The backplate unit contains both the SA-16 personal alien reactor, which generates enough power to keep the suit operating at full capacity virtually indefinitely, and a rebreather apparatus that renders the wearer completely immune to environmental toxins. Conventional measures of protection are almost meaningless by this point, but a predator could wade through molten lava or withstand a small nuclear blast with, with little more than superficial damage. Space that can walk through fire, through like, you know, uh, stun gas, won't, won't affect the guy inside at all. Continuing, the suit uses powerful serum motors that give it functional strength two or three times greater than that of the average human. This allows the wearer to operate heavy automatic weapons as if they were normal weapons, able to fire on the move, and their accuracy unaffected by recoil. Nor is the wearer slowed by the weight of their equipment. Even the heaviest load is of little consequence to a predator. Nor indeed are walls. The sheer bulk of the suit means it can charge straight through many of them with no ill effects whatsoever. However, design is limited by its view cone and weapon selection. The reduced spatial awareness caused by the enclosed helmet is compounded by the poor peripheral vision granted by the cameras, effectively giving the wearer a permanent case of tunnel vision. Additionally, the massive armor gauntlets of the Predator are simply too large and clumsy to use much of our equipment. Heavy weapons can be modified easily enough, but a battle suit cannot use layer weapons or other equipment like grenades, stun weapons, or protective shields. Much like an actual tank, a predator will require infantry support if it is to be fully effective. So yeah, it's basically a heavy weapons user only. It can't use grenades, it can't use light weapons, it can't use stun weapons, it can't use shields. It's just a walking tank that uses heavy weapons. But it is a piece of a, of a unit, and we'll, we'll want to get a couple of them. I've already started making them, so we'll do so. We may have an autopsy in a moment, since I picked up the Rift Corpse. Alright, so. The Plasma Bolt. The Plasma Bolt is a heavy plasma weapon that fires explosive plasma projectiles that inflict severe damage on the target and anything else caught in the blast. It has been used to upgrade our base defense batteries, but can also be mounted on a combat vehicle. The weapon uses an enhanced version of the plasma generation system used in the infantry plasma weapons, making full use of its space available in an vehicle turret. Every important component has been scaled up to improve the overall power of the weapon, though not at all has been resized equally. E.g., we have fitted a dispro disproportionate large alien power cell, which boosts the damage of the weapon, but also increases the ammunition capacity. The resulting projectile is almost twice as large as the one produced by an infantry plasma rifle, and is far better damage than our penetration. It is also useful to point to fast weapon, weapon for facilities. The bolt is powerful enough to inflict damage on a target several kilometers away, and we have performed additional work on spinning the projectile to prevent it veering badly off target over distance. The rotary force imparted by the helical electromax in the weapon is lost after only a few hundred meters or so, making it worthless for an anti-air battery fire. We have discovered a second graviton generator can be used in tandem with the first to create a linked pair of gravitons that over one another. The entire projectile spins as they do so, allowing it to retain a stable flight path for several kilometers. So basically, this is now my base defense weapon. I can plant on vehicles, and it's just you know all around this is a badass piece of uh, technology. And let's go. Ah, cool, the buzzard jumpsuit. So this is basically like the wolf armor, but a little bit different. Basically, it's a little bit, uh, you know, less armor and less weight. But the buzzard jumpsuit is a variant of the wolf battle armor designed for mobility over protective ability. 
It is fitted with an integrated jump unit, a device that allows the wearer to move vertically on the battlefield. It's basically can fly. Refinement of the armor plate has decreased weight, slightly reducing protection but letting the soldier carry more in the battle. Hooray! The jump unit is rather substantially device worn in the back harness. It consists of a miniaturized alien reactor connected to a pair of thrusters that sit above the wearer's shoulders, paired with various gyroscope flight control systems and sensors. Though the jump unit is not powerful enough for a prolonged flight, the user is able to hover for short periods if necessary, even though those who are not trained as pilots should find it easy enough to use in combat. Input from the wearer is recorded via touchpads in the gloves, allowing them to steer their entire flight path, sadly also preventing them from using weapons while airborne. So basically he can't use you know, weapons while he's in flight, but he can fly. A complex array of vector thrust ports copied from the alien directional thrusters design provide fine control and all stabilization when in flight. Clearly the ability to jump atop buildings or leap in passable terrain has uh, utility on a battlefield, particularly for your scouts and marksmen. Soldiers regularly exposed to the enemy fire will likely still need to um, add protection to the wolf hover. So basically, it's not going to be like, you know, um, a heavy combat armor, but it's going to be used for like, you know, snipers to get on rooftops to basically snipe at people. And that's probably what I'll be using it for if I uh, build any, and I probably will build a couple. And I guess we want to sort of get this out of the way, so let's work on that. I want this to basically see what the aliens are up to when they're, you know, attacking me. I'm already building enough stuff, so I'll wait for this stuff to get built before I do anything else. Ah, here's the Wraith autopsy I was waiting for. A Wraith stands roughly 180 centimeters, 6 foot tall, and is probably the most exotic of the extraterrestrial encountered to date. Only vaguely humanoid, it has triple jointed legs and a bulbous head with glowing, fleshy protrusions on each side. Disturbingly, they are reported to possess the ability to teleport around a battlefield, allegedly even through solid objects. So basically, um, you yeah, didn't really get to see it because he was already dead, but this guy can teleport. And that means that he can essentially go anywhere on the battlefield. He doesn't have to fly or anything, he just, you know, teleport somewhere. And it's quite devastating if uh, you don't watch your, you know, your corners like I do. Alright, continuing. Wraiths have a well-developed muscular system that is otherwise unremarkable leaving them closely matched with humans in terms of strength and resilience. They possess four main internal organs, all of which are completely unrecognizable and appear to have hybrid functions. Each is protected by a surgically implanted armor plane composed of the same materials used in UFO construction, though in this case it is only a few millimeters thick and possesses unusual flexibility. It appears both effective and unobtrusive, quite why um, subdural armor is not present in other aliens we cannot say. This suggests these aliens have an important role within the alien hierarchy. Though I doubt we are, well, we are looking at alien leaders, the race may re well represent the alien elite forces. The vast heads of these creatures contain a fixed skull, reinforced with a protective armor plate, underneath which lies an expansive brain. The glowing nodules on each side of the skull comprise largely soft tissue packed with respiratory cells that produce immense amounts of energy. The glow seems to be a side effect of this. These biological reactions consume almost 50,000 calories every hour, and thus cannot be a product of natural evolution. The only possible explanation is that they fed directly into the bloodstream through an abucus valves circularly implanted in the necks of these extraterrestrial soldiers. The other discovery of note is that these nodules sit atop an opening in the skull, meaning any blow of significant force would likely kill the creature outright. A bullet will certainly do the job. As the rest of the skull is well protected, these nodules must be extremely important likely linked to the power of teleportation. We plan to amputate them for, from a live specimen captured immediately to test the theory. If it does not teleport out of its containment tank once it regains consciousness, we will be proved correct. If not, I foresee having some difficulty interrogating the beast. So yes, fun. Especially when I capture one. And yes, financial issues. Uh, one one being called. All right, so let's just do a quick check here. So at this point, my uh, Marauder, two days, twenty-two hours. So that's almost complete. It's getting there. Just a little bit more time. All right, the plasma explosives. So these are basically like my new uh, C4, my new grenades, stuff like that. The ilium reactor can extract more useful energy from the same lump of ilium than a less advanced device can. 
The technology of the alien reactor itself may not be directly applicable to our existing alien explosives, but the principles it operates on are. With a low-grade alien, it is reasonably destructive of explosive on its own right. This is a rather crude way of using the energy. Using it to generate superheated plasma is a more efficient way of damaging a target than just dumping the energy from the explosive into the air around it, which has a high thermal resistance. As such, we have developed a miniaturized plasma generator that can be used to rapidly convert all the warhead energy into expanding sphere of plasma. This pushes the air around the point of uh, detonation aside, rather than transmitting energy through it. Losing less energy to the thermal resistance increases the destructive energy of the explosive. This has allowed us to design a plasma grenade and plasma rocket to replace the existing ilium explosives and a plasma charge to replace our existing C4 explosives. These plasma explosives are available to our men in effective unlimited quantities, so we have withdrawn the obsolete weapons and replaced them accordingly. In order to minimize disruption to combat operations, the only difference between them is increased damage. So basically, more damage. Awesomeness. And then the plasma warheads, and these go basically on the uh, Marauder and the Foxtrot, and of course the Condor too, I guess. The development of plasma-based explosives have also allowed us to improve the design of our air-to-air -air munitions, creating a new generation of weapons that replace the existing alien warheads with more advanced technology. Our current alien warheads are certainly powerful explosives, but unfortunately they must rely on explosive energy for their armor penetration. Hardly a deal against armor, designed specifically for re to resist the heat from oral and re-entry. It proved more effective to use a portion of the energy in the ilium to power a small plasma generator that forms a superhead glow of energy at the front of a warhead as it detonates. This acts like a plasma drill and melts the path through the armor, thus the thrust for the rocket engines providing a momentum need for penetration. The remaining energy in the warhead is then used to drain an explosion in the same manner as a conventional alien warhead. The energy drained by a previous stage means that this explosion is smaller than before, but the greater penetration of the warhead means that we will actually inflict 40 to 50% more damage. In all respects, the warheads are identical to pre previous generation. We can fit them to our existing rocket motors and produce the new missiles in large numbers as at natural cost. I've taken the liberty of recouping our uh, aircraft accordingly. So basically, new weapons for our uh, aircraft to use as well. And that basically is this, the Scimitar tank. And days go by. Alright, the Quantum Cryptological Center. This is a new base structure I can build. The Quantum Cryptological Center is a new structure that can be constructed in our bases, allowing us to decrypt the communications emanating from alien craft that have been detected by the base's radar arrays. This will give us full details on the UFCO's class, mission, and crew. The decryption algorithm developed by my team when studying the alien communication array has been used to produce listening devices that can capture and decode alien transmissions in real time. All that they require is the position of the UFO that they will be tracking, provided by the radar tracking systems already in place at your base. The cryptological center uses a scaling superconductor architecture that can track unlimited numbers of UFOs, tracking numerous signals simultaneously will draw additional power and may lead to temporary power cuts in non-essential areas. AG leisure facilities, engineering department. But important base structures can be used, um, uh, structures such as the command room and laboratories will remain unaffected. The design of a listening device is based on the old Trake supercomputers, but has several um, orders of magnitude more powerful. The level of encryption on alien signals is uh, so great that even with access to decryption key, it still requires a vast amount of computing power to code the message. An entirely new generation of specialized quantum computing, communicating hardware is needed to be designed to perform these calculations. Thankfully, I rose to challenge. This structure should prove extremely useful for coordinating our air defense and appropriately equipping our troops prior to battles. Basically, um, with this, I can like you know know that um, I'm going to be flying androids, for example, so I don't bring some rockets, or I might be able to find those reapers on the ground, so I have to watch out for that. So I'm going to want to build those eventually, and everyone else will just work on the scimitar tank for now. I'm running out of stuff to research. Is that good or bad? Good, I guess. I'm not sure I'm going to put anyone in there, but good. Ah, the Scimitar support tank. 
My team has finished work on a VH2 Scimitar, a remotely piloted battlefield vehicle designed to provide close support to our strike teams. It is slower than a hunter scout car, but it's much more capable, capable of combatant. It is considerably tougher than its predecessor, and is armor of a powerful integrated pulse laser, which can be upgraded in the future if we develop better weapons. The chassis of the scimitar is squat, but sturdy, giving the vehicle low profile and providing ample space for the vehicle's power plant, the ER-4 Ilium Impulsion Reactor, a downscale version of the Corsair's ER-3 reactor. The turret weapon draws power directly from the reactor, eliminating the need for enemy ammunition storage areas in the turret. Instead, this space is, houses a comp complex array of cameras, sensors, semi intelligent um, alien electronics inside the vehicle handle many of the uh, simpler tasks, usually performed by a driver. Allowing us to situate the vehicle pilots, uh, pilots safely within a control uh, facility back at the base. I personally fitted single boosters to our dropships that allow a driver to control the vehicle as if it were inside it, despite potentially being thousands of miles away. Unsurprisingly, our tests so far suggest I've done an excellent job setting everything up. Removal of the driver is a two chief advantages. The first is that the removal of the crew compartment and the ventilation system leaves space for additional armor, naturally itself also constructed from alien materials. Given that the vehicle uh, are large targets on a battlefield, this added durability is extremely valuable. Secondly, the fact that one of your units is a lump of inert metal, a but an expensive one, rather than a living and breathing human being may be a battlefield decision a little bit easier for you. So. Basically, if this gets blown to smithereens, I'm not going to lose a, a person who has, you know, has experience. This doesn't gain experience. And that's basically it for research. I've got nothing else. And I can build that now. And the UFOs come. Alright, so next time I continue on, um, I hopefully I'm going to build the Marauder up and, uh, couple of Predator Armors products from Delta, or Beta rather, and uh, we'll see how things go from there. For now, take care.